Welcome, brothers and sisters of Adam, to my second video on the melee weapons of Fallout. The weapons we are covering run the gamut between well-known and beloved weapons and ones that many of you have probably never even used before. As promised, at the end of this video is not one, but two comment highlights since I missed last week's because life got in the way and I wanted to get the video out on time. So let's get this video started with one of my favorite melee weapons. Starting this off strong, the iconic melee weapon known as the Shish Kebab first featured in Fallout 3 and has featured in every Fallout since. The so-called Junk Shish Kebab features in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas as it is a craftable item in 3 which turns a motorcycle gas tank, handbrake, lawnmower blade, and a pilot light once the player has discovered the schematics into a Shish Kebab. This flaming sword is quite the formidable weapon for melee weapon builds and benefits from the Pyromaniac perk. It is interesting to note that the Shish Kebab itself weighs half of what all the junk components that are used to make it weigh, perhaps indicating that the junk parts are stripped down to their essential parts. The fact that the motorcycle tank is used as a reservoir for whatever flammable fluid is used for the shish kebab also answers the question posed in my second vehicle's video about whether the motorcycles were gasoline or nuclear, as such a tank doesn't make any sense with a nuclear propulsion setup. The player also never has to top up whatever flammable substance that the shish kebab uses to set targets ablaze, which is more than likely an intentional game design, but perhaps indicates that whatever fuel was left in the tank powers the shish kebab although gasoline definitely would have deteriorated to an unusable state by the time Fallout 3 takes place. The shish kebab in Fallout 4 and 76 looks different from previous games, while also acting a good bit different, even though it operates similarly. This version of the shish kebab is not crafted, and is very obviously made from an actual sword that appears to be a wakizashi, which is interesting because the wakizashi only appears in one Fallout game, and that is all the way back in Fallout 2. It still has a lever that appears similar to the handbrake that controls the flow of flammable gas that ignites at points along the blade. While there is no real great comparison for a weapon like the shish kebab, flaming swords have a very long history in mythology and is popular in a lot of fantasy as well. There is an instance of a flaming sword in Warhammer 40k with the Emperor's Sword, but it is not a great comparison because of how post-apocalyptic and diesel punk the shish kebab is. There are a lot of interesting facts about the shish kebab. One is that the concept art labels it as the shishka sword, which I think they probably did the right thing keeping the name as the shish kebab. Another is that the player and his companions that wield it in Fallout 3 and New Vegas will wear an oven mitt to protect their hand while using the weapon, which, while not exactly flattering, sure is effective. Looking at concept art, it is also very apparent that there was meant to be a hose system leading from the gas tank to the sword, but this is never represented in the game. Fallout 4, rather than using a system that sprays a flammable fluid along the length of the sword, like in Fallout 3, uses a flammable gas, which is most likely propane since the maker of the canister attached to the shish kebab is Schult, which is advertised in Fallout 4 and 76 to sell propane. The Fallout 4 design seems more refined, which may mean that someone had seen a shish kebab like that from Fallout 3 and liked it, but decided to make it better by ditching the big gas tank. It also begs the question that can be asked of all the craftable items in Fallout 3. Who created the schematics? It was obviously a post-war effort since it calls for items that can be salvaged rather than real machined parts. The unique variant in New Vegas called the Gehenna boasts more damage, a slightly altered appearance and brighter flame that can be obtained from the Vendertron from the Gunrunners DLC. Bats are a group of weapons that are found in all the Fallout games in mostly the same form. Starting with the Louisville Slugger which is a very standard looking wooden bat. The Louisville Slugger is a brand of bats that became famous after Pete Louisville Slugger Browning began using the bats from the Hillerich and Bradsby company when, according to him, the new bat helped him get out of his no-hit slump. The Louisville Slugger in Fallout 2 is a standard looking bat, but has the benefit or detriment of knocking enemies back after a critical hit. I say detriment because the player can often spend a lot of time having to chase down the players that they send flying across the grid. Fallout Tactics also has the Slugger, which is not as good as in Fallout 2, but is otherwise similar looking. In Fallout 3, the baseball bat is commonly found and looks similar to previous versions in other games. 
that has a B on the side, and since 1879 printed as well, implying the manufacturer has been making them for a long time. There are two unique variants in Fallout 3 that never made the final cut. The Curse Breaker can be equipped in-game with console commands, but makes the player character disappear, although NPCs can still see and interact with the player. The other is the Excalibat, which is a reference to a weapon of the same name from Rise of the Triad Dark War. There's also a dirty variant that is never featured in the game, shown here. New Vegas features the same bat, just having it deal extra damage and share the same Grand Slam special attack as the shovel, nail board, and pool cue. It is also one of the more durable melee weapon options, which seems logical to me. The Gunrunner's Arsenal has a version of the bat that accepts modifications that not only changes the attributes but the appearance. The Cork Core modification increases attack speed, the Nail modification increases damage, and the Maple modification increases the condition by 50%, which is pretty substantial. The Nail Bat is also a weapon in the Brotherhood of Steel game. Fallout 4 has the good old plain wood bat, which is pretty plentiful in the Commonwealth, but can be modified more than any other game due to the modification system implemented in Fallout 4 and 76. The modifications to increase damage or bleeding effects are barbed, spiked, sharp, chain wrapped, and bladed. Different types of damage, like fire or electric, can be added with the heat coil or shocking modifications. And lastly, we can put a rocket on the bat with the Nuka World DLC. It is not clear how the user would activate or increase the rocket thrusters, or even where the fuel would be stored, but the fuel is never required from the player. The player can also change the bat material from mahogany, cedar, oak, or aluminum. It is interesting to note that the most common kind of wood used for bats in the major leagues is maple, largely due to its hardness. However, ash trees were used prior because of how light they were, and birch is sometimes preferred because it is lighter than maple, but more durable than ash. Aluminum bats are not allowed in the major leagues because they are the best of all the worlds. They are light, so can be swung fast and are very hard, allowing for exceptional energy transfer to the ball. In a survival or defense situation, the aluminum bat would be the best option for that reason. I find it interesting that the wood options given in Fallout 4 are none of the more popular kinds used in our world. There are some unique variants including the 2076 World Series bat, which has a 6% chance of sending the enemy flying like a game-winning home run, and has a World Champion sticker on the bat itself. The distance that enemies fly from the home run hit is dependent on the luck of the player. Swatters and the Rockville Slugger are slightly better than the baseline baseball bat, and sold by Moe in Diamond City. The Fence Buster found in Far Harbor that has the penetrating effect and Sito's shiny slugger from the Nuka World DLC with the relentless legendary effect. Fallout 76 has the same bat as Fallout 4 with the same modifications with the exception of a small chance that the bat will be the so-called all-star kind which offers the highest damage. This section will cover the throwing melee weapons which will include the throwing spears which only about 50 of you mentioned I had forgotten in my previous video. They were planned to be grouped like this. Or maybe I'm lying. Who knows? You don't. Throwing knives feature in Fallout, Fallout 2, Tactics, New Vegas, and 76 in many different forms. In Fallout and Fallout 2, they are the throwing weapon with the largest effective range, although their low damage helps counteract that advantage. On a critical hit, they can knock the enemy unconscious, which the player can then usually target the enemy's eye with for a 95% hit chance and finish off the job. The game states that the knives are made out of titanium and are laser sharpened. This surprised me, since that is a lot of effort to produce a low damage weapon, and even uses an expensive metal and production process. While there are many kinds of throwing knives and even more types of knives in general, throwing knives tend to be straight, undecorated, and symmetrical to give the user the best chances at landing the knife with the blade tip in the target. The knife in the first two fallouts look blade heavy, which is well suited for people that have less throwing experience. In tactics, they are still titanium and laser sharpened, but look more like a conventional throwing knife. They can be used for stabbing, but are much less effective than the traditional knife for that purpose. In New Vegas, they are also more conventional looking, and can be thrown quicker than any other throwing weapon. They are considered holdout weapons, but cannot be picked up and reused after they are thrown for whatever reason. 
Fallout 76 changes the look again and has similar quirks with retrieving thrown ones. Sometimes they can be recovered from a dead enemy, but not if they missed the target. Throwing hatchets can be found in Fallout New Vegas and have a different shape and weight from the normal hatchets, which is likely to make them more effective at throwing. Throwing hatchets have the highest damage of any throwing weapon, which is offset by its relative rarity. It also has very high item health, which is never really realized by the player because once it is thrown, it is not recoverable. Finally, I will get around to talking about throwing spears, like I promised. These weapons actually look quite a bit like the spears from Fallout and Fallout 2, with the large barb at the base of the spearhead. This actually makes more sense for a thrown spear, since the user intends to not have the spear to fight after it has been thrown, and if the spearhead can stick in the enemy, it can be difficult to remove, and if it doesn't get removed, it can continue to cut the flesh and do damage. These are preferred by Kaisar's Legion, and are plentiful in the Mojave. The spears are apparently 6 feet in length, but appear to be even larger when in third person. They also have the ability to pin dismembered body parts to the walls, just like the railway rifle. The player character will also hold the spears at the hip when they are not equipped, which would be a very dangerous place considering the spear point could very easily cut or stab the character's head. All throwing weapons in Fallout New Vegas can be poisoned, which increases their effectiveness. Fallout Tactics is the only game to feature throwing stars, which is an okay weapon as far as throwing weapons go. They are quite plain as they are unadorned and have four points, but are a reasonable shape for their use. They would be classified as Hira Shuriken, since they are thin metal throwing objects, as opposed to Bow Shuriken, which are made of sharpened metal spikes in various forms. Machete's first feature in Fallout Tactics, and is shown as a standard form of machete, called the Bush Machete. It is a decent starting weapon, but is generally not used for too long in favor of higher damage weapons. Machetes are also found in Fallout New Vegas, and are usually wielded by Kaisar's Legion. They also have a very makeshift appearance, and close examination can show that they are made of a lawnmower blade. It does extra damage to limbs and has the special attack called the Backslash that does 70% more damage in VATS and does not require any melee skill to execute. Machetes are interesting weapons since their primary purpose is as a tool and not a weapon. Where a sword is purpose built to fight, the machete is not. Due to this there are some distinct differences, like machetes generally being shorter but with a thicker and heavier blade, which puts the point of balance in the blade. Swords are generally made to have the point of balance as close to the handle as possible to make swing recovery easier and quicker since the user is not having to overcome the increased torque that a higher point of balance introduces. This makes it an interesting choice for Kaisar's Legion who are widely known for avoiding firearms for their non-elite units since putting extra effort into a proper sword for hand-to-hand -hand combat would seem to make more sense to me. There are a few unique variants including the Liberator, which does extra damage and is carried by Dead Sea, which was given to him by his Centurion after his victory over the Sundogs. The Machete Gladius is very different looking from the standard Machete, but has the same extra damage to limbs and is used more like a Machete than a sword since it has an enlarged and heavy upper blade, which would give slashing attacks more damage. Although it shares the same name with the Roman Gladius, it does not look like a gladius and would not function much like one either. Although there are many types of the gladius, they were all similar in shape, being a short, wider sword with a triangular tip. Comparing the machete gladius to the most common gladius known as the Pompeii gladius shows that there is quite a difference between the two, but this was likely a purposeful change on the legion's part. The broad machete looks like a proper machete of the bolo type instead of the makeshift lawnmower blade we see in the other machetes. It was first only available to those that pre-ordered the game, but has since been released with the courier stash add-on. It has higher DPS than the standard machete, but does not have the same limb bonus damage. In Honest Hearts, the white leg pain makers will carry poisoned machetes, although the player character cannot equip it without console commands. Fallout 4 also has a standard looking bush machete, likely being produced prior to the Great War. It has the ability to be given a serrated edge to boost the damage and can be a good beginning melee weapon. The Krem's Tooth, although it looks nothing like a machete, is in fact classified as a machete. This is most obvious when looking at the handle, but the blade looks very different as it is quite menacing looking. 
it is given the legendary effect known as Sacrificial Blade, which does bleeding and poison damage for a short duration after striking, as well as boosting the overall damage. This legendary effect can actually be removed and applied to any other machete, which is unusual for legendary effects. It is found at the bottom of a mine that serves as a Lovecraftian themed dungeon. This is one of my favorite weapons from what I think is one of the most interesting places in Fallout 4. Fallout 76 features the same machete that is found in Fallout 4 without any notable unique versions or differences. The next group of melee weapons can't be easily lumped together except to say that they are all used as tools first and weapons second. Unless you are in the Fallout world, then your only option is to murder other people with them. Because we know they're not using them to build and fix stuff. Starting with the crowbar, which is found in Fallout, Fallout 2, and Fallout Tactics. In Fallout and Fallout 2, it can actually be used as a tool to get into some locked containers or stuck doors, although most players are used to its more destructive uses. It is a very standard looking crowbar that has red paint flaking off. Fallout Tactics has a different looking crowbar but is exclusively used for fighting, noting that it is a piece of metal designed to exert leverage or pound heads. The hammer is usually seen in-game as a junk item that is either useless or can be scrapped for materials. There exists, however, a version that is used to hammer other things, if you know what I mean. And what I mean is hammer other people's faces, in case you weren't following. The claw hammer is a weapon in Fallout Tactics that is often used by the Beast Lords and is a very weathered old claw hammer. There isn't too much more to say about that. The scalpel is another weapon that is only found in Fallout Tactics, although scalpels can be found in every Fallout afterwards. It is just junk or a scrappable item and cannot be used to fight, unless it's loaded into a rocket launcher or junk jet and shot at someone. It is not a great weapon, but the player will start with it if they choose Doctor as a tag skill. The vaunted and deadly weapon known as the Pipe can be used starting in Fallout Tactics. Although it is called the Iron Pipe, the description mentions that it is a short length of lead pipe, so there is a bit of confusion there. Fallout 3 has an actual lead pipe that has some sort of fitting threaded onto one end to, to give it a little extra weight and some edges so that it can do serious damage. It is also modified to have tape where the handle is to increase grip. It is very durable, as it should be, but it will break and can be repaired somehow. Fallout New Vegas has a lead pipe that looks just like that in Fallout 3 and has the lights out special attack. There's also the so-called humble cudgel, which is a unique version of the lead pipe sporting a bent metal section and a T fitting on the end. It does a bit more damage and costs fewer action points and vats. Raul also has a unique version that looks the same but has slightly longer reach than the normal pipe. Fallout 4 and 76 both also have the lead pipe which looks like what can be found in Fallout 3 and New Vegas. They can be modified with the spiked or heavy modifications for more damage. Shovels are also present in many games starting in Fallout 2 where it is just a tool to, and this is from the game itself, dig ditches and stuff. By stuff, they must mean dig up dead people's graves because that's the usual purpose in Fallout 2. In Fallout 3's Point Lookout, shovels are commonly carried by the swamp folk and are used in a quest to dig up the treasure on Dove Delta. It can also be used as a weapon, although it is not great. The fertilizer shovel is the unique variant that can be obtained from Croatoa and is apparently covered in fertilizer that deals poison damage. This poison damage stacks and it causes one to wonder what kind of fertilizer are they using. Ammonium nitrate, which is a popular option, can be dangerous when ingested as it breaks down into nitrites that then oxidize the hemoglobin which makes our blood cells unable to carry oxygen, causing people to appear gray or blue in color. I think it is more likely, however, that the fertilizer is a biological fertilizer that is causing the poisoning on contact. Interestingly, this weapon has the largest reach of any melee weapon in the game. In Fallout New Vegas, the shovel can be primarily used to dig up graves like in earlier fallouts, but also function as a weak melee weapon. They can also be useful as the jury rigging perk allows them to repair more valuable melee weapons, like super sledges. It is also interesting to note that although the model is exactly the same as the shovel from Point Lookout, it actually lacks the higher resolution textures that are represented in Point Lookout. In Fallout 4 and 76, these shovels only exist as junk items. The favored weapon of grandmas everywhere, the rolling pin, can be found in Fallout 3, 
through Fallout 76. In Fallout 3, it is one of the weakest weapons, but also one of the rarest non-unique melee weapons in the game. A special variant can be found only in the Tranquility Lane simulation, which does more damage, but can only be equipped with console commands. In New Vegas, it goes from one of the weakest to just straight up the weakest, unless you're fighting the Pillsbury Doughboy or something. It has the Lights Out special attack in New Vegas, and is used to attack the player in my favorite Wild Wastelands encounter, Mods Muggers where three ornery old ladies attempt to mug the player. Fallout 4 allows you to modify the rolling pin to have nails driven through it, have blades embedded in it, or be made of aluminum. Up to this point, I honestly didn't know they had made rolling pins out of aluminum, but alas, here they are. Fallout 76 has the same rolling pin and upgrades as Fallout 4. The tire iron first features in Fallout 3 and is commonly used by raiders. Although not very powerful, the attack speed is impressive. The unique variant Highwayman's Best Friend is a reference to the Highwayman from Fallout 2 and does more damage while weighing a little bit more. The swing sounds, attack speed, and swing style is the exact same as the lead pipe. The tire iron gets a damage boost in Fallout New Vegas, making it not a bad early game weapon and it has the lights out special attack, which does 125% more damage in VATS at the cost of more action points. In Fallout 4, it can be a decent early game weapon when modified with a large blade that really just turns it into an axe. The tire iron in Fallout 76 is just like that in Fallout 4. The favored weapon of grandpas everywhere, canes, feature in some fallouts and in New Vegas the dress cane is found in the Ultralux used by the White Glove Society. They are made of wood with an ivory handle and are a type of fritz or tea handle cane. I would really be interested to know where they are sourcing their ivory from, since it would probably have to come from a wasteland creature. The dress cane has the lights out special attack. Fallout 4 and 76 both feature walking canes that have the tourist or hooked handle. They have very low damage, but the lowest AP cost of any melee weapon. The barbed and spiked variants have different values when you go to sell them and are supposed to have different damage stats but are exactly the same so it doesn't make any sense to spend the extra resources on the spiked version. In Fallout 76, it can actually end up being one of the highest damage one-handed melee weapons in the game, beating out the Assaultron Blade. A cosmetic modification can also be applied making it look like a large candy cane. Fallout 76 also features a Shepherd's Crook, which can be used to prod Brahmin along at a faster pace or attack enemies with a swing attack. The Straight Razor can be found in Fallout New Vegas, and while it's not a great weapon, damage-wise, it is a holdout weapon, and benefits from increased critical chances. A unique variant known as Figaro has a stainless steel case with some intricate engravings on the blade. It has increased attack damage and can be obtained from the King's member, Sergio. Far Harbor introduced a new melee weapon, the Pull Hook, which is a pretty fierce looking weapon in its own right. These are used to haul larger fish onto boats by hooking them and heaving them onto the boat, and due to the heavy fishing presence at Far Harbor, is a common weapon there. The barbed end would make it difficult for the target to get away from the user, although there are some situations where I can see that being detrimental, like when you are attacking a very dangerous creature that you need to keep at a distance. This is not pictured in game, however, and the pole hook is used more or less like any other melee weapon. It has the ability to get the punching mod to increase damage and be armor piercing. The fish catcher is a unique variant with the VATS enhanced legendary effect, giving 40% fewer action points. Blood letter is another unique variant that causes bleeding damage that can stack to be very deadly. Fallout 76 features the same pole hook that is found in Fallout 4. Fallout 76 has a unique weapon, the sickle, which has decent attack stats but cannot be modified at a workbench. Unfortunately, there's not really much more to this weapon. The drill is a weapon in Fallout 76 that is a cordless drill. It is made by Stenley and called the Drillomatic and has a pretty standard looking drill bit attached. It has Made in America stamped on the bottom of the 18 volt battery and while it doesn't do a lot of damage, it does continuous damage that can add up really quickly. It can be equipped with a piercing bit which is likely to be a metal or ceramic boring bit for that extra penetration. At first glance, it seems like the drill is a bit over-stylized, however, when looking at older hand drills, it is really not far-fetched. Some examples like this Black & Decker drill, DeSuter drill gun type R1, or this Light Burn 3 8 dual speed drill are some examples of how stylized they could be. The only real obvious difference is that the drill in Fallout is cordless, but it does seem to be on its last leg, 
as sparks and black smoke can be seen on the sides when it is being used, which, in case you were wondering, is not a good sign. Now, on to my video highlights, and this time we are covering two videos. The first highlights are from the Fallout Bible video, which was received much better than I honestly thought it would be. It was also a lot more information than I had expected once I read out the whole timeline. If you noticed that I was getting a little bit tired there near the end, then you're right, because I had to do it all in one sitting. Also, given my pattern of a the blank of Fallout, weapons of Fallout, and video essay pattern, this series will be released every third video. Sorry if that is too slow for you, and if people really want back-to-back -back episodes, let me know in the comments and I can change that. The first highlight is not one comment but many that shared the same sentiment. That they had always wanted to read the Bible but had never had the time and so an audio format is perfect for them. I was really glad to hear this, and I am sure this is part of the welcoming reception the video received. I try to make most of my videos ones that can be just listened to and are just enhanced by some visuals, since that is how I usually consume my YouTube videos myself. The second one is yet another group of comments that all said the same thing, that I made a mistake. I know, none of you can actually believe it, but it's true. I failed to mention that Vault 69 DID have a mention in the form of the webcomic One Man and a Crate of Puppets that was meant to hype Fallout 3's release. I may do a video on this in the future, but it is a pretty bizarre little webcomic, and Vault 69's existence is confirmed in it. A bunch of you noticed Malcolm Holmes just showing up halfway up the solar tower at Helios 1, and all of your comments were exactly what I was thinking and feeling when I realized who it was. That dude is seriously persistent. Dark Productions has a good comment on something that I'll talk about as the Bible episodes come out. That is, that it's apparent there was a disagreement even among the developers about what the main driver for mutations across the wasteland was and the tug of war between FEV and radiation is something that I don't think is definitively settled even to this day. There will be more on this later though. Nikolay Mihailov wrote a good comment about transistors and their place in the Fallout world. It's a good comment and is worth a read and again, Go through my comments and see that there are plenty of people that say, of course there were transistors, look at all the lore reasons why, and others that say, actually, transistors weren't invented, or transistors were invented right before the Great War. This subject is far from being unanimously understood, but I do want to make my position clear that I don't think transistors were never invented or invented just before the Great War. I do think there are unexplained reasons why they were not so prevalent, However, any reasons I have seen or heard are conjecture. There were some comments talking about the official status of the Bible as canon, and these are two examples. While there are many that lament that the Bible has been put into a semi-canon status, that would mean that there is no reason to believe it is not canon unless explicitly contradicted by newer games. The Bible itself was an evolving document, as the later videos on the Bible will make clear. That's it for the Fallout Bible video highlights. Now on to the previous video highlights, the second video about the chems of Fallout. Many, many of you responded to my question about what you thought the gauge might represent on the stim packs. Like many of you, I naturally assumed it was a pressure gauge since the injection sounds make it apparent that there is some pressure being released. The only thing that makes me question that are the numbers on the gauge. Looking at Fallout 76, it increments by 30, with the gauge sitting at just under 60, which seems like a really high pressure at first glance. After doing some research, 60 psi is definitely too high for safe injection of really anything, whether it be intravenous or intramuscular, but perhaps the numbers are not psi, and instead are kilopascals. Some IVs have a necessary injection pressure of around 100 kilopascals, so this could indeed be a pressure gauge in kilopascals. Some of you were very creative, saying perhaps it measured pH, bacterial content, temperature, radiation levels, etc. If I were to officially choose, I think pressure represented in kilopascals is the most likely, but if anyone can make a good case for something else, I'm more than willing to accept something else. Jesse Bates wrote a long comment going over the possibilities that is definitely worth a read. A few of you mentioned Datura since it is a plant that a few chems are derived from in Fallout New Vegas, and I totally did everyone a disservice by not talking a bit more about it and the interesting 
physiological, and psychological effects it has on people. This comment here by Digital VHS sums things up pretty well though. Tone Thick also mentioned that muscle stiffness is a common effect from Datura, and that could explain the hardening effect we see from the chems derived from the plant. Jaeger Bishop mentioned that stim packs can be crafted in New Vegas with the same ingredients as the healing powder. So I wonder, what came first, the healing powder or the stim pack? Did corporate America market a less well-known herbal remedy, or is this a case of some sort of convergent evolution where the post-war ingredients mutated into something that did the same thing? I'm not sure. Quip tipped nicked Fimk? Man, what is that name? Brought to my attention that Fixer was originally intended to only temporarily remove symptoms of addiction, but does not operate that way in the game. That would honestly make it more interesting as a chem, and if Fixer was a slightly more common chem than Addictol, it could help people bridge the gap to a permanent addiction solution. Razia the Seeker noted that Night Stalker Squeezins are a reference to Snake Squeezins from the Wasteland series, and is an alcohol-like drug. This totally makes sense given the huge inspiration the Wasteland series was to Fallout, and how Fallout was viewed really as a spiritual successor. A few of you mentioned that the alien biogel might be a reference to Bacta from Star Wars. Now I have to say, the shared blue color and healing effect really does make it seem like there is a possible inspiration. Although, if I understand it correctly, often the user submerges themselves or the affected area in Bacta, whereas the amount of alien biogel in a given container would only be enough to slather some on a wound. Shockingly, I made another error when I said that super stims were only available in the nuclear winter game mode in Fallout 76. They can in fact be found in the base game, and now I must go ask Adam for forgiveness for leading you all astray. Manny Jazzcats reminded me that I failed to mention Afterburner gum from Fallout Tactics, so I will mention it here. This red gum is a methamphetamine chewing gum which increases AP points, strength and perception but has a temporary addiction penalty rather than a permanent one. This makes it quite useful since you don't risk the permanent addiction. This also reminds me of a comment I saw that corrected me to say that Panza Chocolata is a myth but the other examples of amphetamine use by World War II powers were legitimate. Ian Dina mentions that the reveal from the Cabot family quest that there was purportedly the ruins of an alien civilization in the Rubal Khali in Saudi Arabia, that is where the pendant was found that gave him power and features prominently in the quest. The supposition here is that since the alien biogel does have some compatibility with humans, perhaps this old civilization integrated with humans, which would make us part alien. Although the only issue with this is, according to the game, the ruins of the city, called Ubar, predated human civilization by four millennia. However, it is an interesting thought. That is it for my comment highlights, and I hope if you made it this far that you enjoyed them, along with the video. As always, I am very grateful and continually surprised by how engaging, supportive, smart, and creative you all are. Please stay that way, and may you all walk in Adam's glow.